In the next subsection, we'll look at our basic machine model that we'll use for most of the module. And that's the random access machine model, called the RAM model for short. To motivate a little bit of some of the complications I'm about to mention, let's do this little question of uh, uh, essentially jumping ahead of ourselves. So uh, this already is talking in terms of asymptotic, uh, asymptotic costs. What's the cost of adding two integers? Question? Well, well, we'll discuss it. Don't spoil the questions. So we had 63 vote for the attendance code. So we should get at least 60 again, right? Uh, and you, you remember, like, this is, it's participation marks for Slido, not getting it correct. This might be the first question with an actual correct answer. Uh, so, yeah, let me reiterate. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're voting for something that's not the correct answer. Okay, results trickle in. Uh, 59, all that counts as 60. Good. Okay, so we have votes for most of the answers, right? Um, and this is somewhat intended. Well, maybe there's no intention to have your answer for the last one, but if that's uh, what it is, uh, that's what it is. Um, try to lock that now. So there's, uh, as you may see on your devices, there's a lot of, a lot of correct answers. Uh, the problem is it depends on, on your model. Uh, it's a bit of a well, religious question. What do you believe about your computers? Uh, you can argue it's constant time. Yeah? yeah. Let, let, me, let me run through this because we, we have to get through this in time. But we can take it offline. Um, so. There's an argument to be made for each of these answers. You can say it's constant time because, you know, my computer has 64-bit integers. I can add those two up in, in one or two cycles. Uh, that's constant time, isn't it? You could also say, well, hold on. If I give you two 20,000-digit long integers, uh, good luck with squeezing them in your, in your fixed-size integer. Either you have overflows and you just get garbage results, or you'll have to spend more time. And if you just do the, the elementary school method of adding two numbers, you're basically going digit by digit in one way or another, carryovers and, and so on. So that takes time proportional to the length of the digits or the, the sum. Uh, so that's, that's the answer in general. OK, the la last one is also correct in a way, but yeah. Uh, the, the point really is there's no good answer to this unless you tell me more. What integers? How big are they? What's the machine? Now, uh, machine models are trying to put all these questions on a solid ground and make, make sure you can answer those definitively. So a machine model has to tell you uh, what algorithms are possible, also because it specifies what programs are. So. Uh, it sounds like it's just the machine, but it really is uh, more than that. Um, it's more influential if you want. And the last bit is important. Um, this is in, implicit in real machines. They just run, and as long as they run, that's the time cost. Uh, for our abstractly defined machines, we will have to say what is cost. How, what, what is the cost of an execution of some program? So uh, we have a bit of conflicting interests here. We want machine models that are as detailed and powerful as our actual machines, because we want to be realistic. At the same time, we want to not have one model for each computer in the room. We'd like to unify that if, if anyhow possible. And then we'd also like to analyze it, which again pushes it to the simple direction. 
And well, I, I don't know. Uh, I thought I'll, in terms of trade offs, I don't know if you can laugh about this. So you usually can't have all three. Pick any two. Um, yeah, you can be smart, honest, or investment banker. Yeah. It's not, not too serious. But let me introduce the random access machine model before we close for today. The random access machine is basically one big array with operations on it. Now, the fun is the array is basically as big as you need it. It's not infinite, but it's unbounded. It's as big as you use it, if you want. You can think of this as whenever you need more memory, you build more disks. That's not quite how computers work these days, uh, but it's also not so far away from it. And cloud computing brought us even closer in, in some ways. The, the problem we're, ha we're having at this point is we try to describe algorithms that solve, remember, a whole instant, a whole class of problems which have an input size. And the inputs can, bet, can get bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you want a machine with an algorithm that can solve all of those, we'll have to allow arbitrarily big inputs. And that's only really possible if we also allow arbitrarily big resources, in particular memory. Uh, there's, there's just no way around it. No fixed machine allows that. Uh, but if you look in history how machines got bigger, there's definitely some truth to it. Question? Is this like we call this machine model besides us? execution cost. So does that yep. mean memory or the time? OK, uh, the question is, well, what's the execution cost? Uh, I didn't get to that yet. Um, okay. uh, so I first want to talk briefly, running out of time, I think. Um, I want to talk briefly about what programs look like on this machine. And uh, the cost will actually just be the number of executed primitive instructions. So that's, that's relatively easy. Uh, as I said, the machine is one big array. What goes in the array? Well, integers. Uh, but we've had this question before, so you should all be asking, how big are the integers? And um, here the catch is, we'll leave that open. We say they have w bits. And w is not fixed per se, but can grow with the input size. So a typical thing is, is this, that w grows with the logarithm of the input, or some multiple of that. Uh, we'll come to why that's a useful thing. But if you think of one big array, then log n is roughly the number of bits you need to specify one position in the array. And it just turns out to be both realistic and convenient to assume that one index into the, into the data fits in one word. The content of the memory we call a word. And so w bit words means each cell in the array can store an integer of w bits. Uh, the operations that fill up most of the slide, uh, they're actually not, not too complicated. So you could do uh, three types of things. You can get a memory cell and copy its <coughs> contents to one of your registers. I haven't talked about registers, haven't I? Uh, you have a fixed number of registers that you can actually compute with. The memory is, is out there, and you have to get all the data into your registers. Then you can compute, and you can write it back. And here, for the registers, again, I don't want to fix a concrete number. Uh, so in a way, you can say, if, if you need five more, that's fine. But it's a fixed constant number. The number of registers does not grow with the input. So you can say 100. Uh, that's usually enough for programs. That would be all right. Uh, if you want to compute, you can do this with the registers. You can do the normal type of arithmetic. Everything is done modulo 2 to the w, modulo the word size. Uh, that's how computers work. This is basically C-style operations. So you can do plus, minus, multiplication, integer division. And you can also do the bitwise tricks that uh, languages like C, Java, Python, they all have something like this. So you can do bitwise and of the numbers, treating the binary digits as individual bits. Uh, and uh, left and right shift, OK, they're basically <laughs> multiplication, so we wouldn't need those. Okay. That's the operations you can do in the register. Second type of operation is load something from the memory into the register and store it back. 
And you could do this by specifying the address with one of your registers. That's an important bit. That means you can do pointers and indirect addressing. OK? Uh, and the last bit you can do is uh, ifs, basically. You can condition on the value of some register. Is the register 0? If so, then jump to five, skip to the next five instructions, something like that. And then the cost of, an, of a program run is just the number of instructions that you need it. This is a super low level kind of machine and, and way to program. Uh, there's a book that describes this in a bit more detail if you feel like this is um, still having some gaps. The key thing I want to point out again, this is essentially programming in C or some other low level language, except for this weird idea that the the word size, the, the size of the integers you can work on in constant time grows with the input. OK? Uh, we'll usually not code in exactly the primitive instructions. We'll allow ourselves the kind of high level code I've shown you in the first lecture. Uh, there's a way to map that high-level code to what we've seen just on the last slide. Uh, it's usually very primitive, or very automatic to do. In fact, compilers are exactly doing that. So we'll, we'll usually allow ourselves to be um, more convenient for human readers. Um, I think you've seen all these. So we use the usual type kind of control flow constructions as you would use them in Python. Uh, we allow ourselves to use variable names instead of just indices of registers and so on. Um, and last important bit, we'll do, we'll count dominant operations. So we'll fix some more abstract things to count instead of all primitive operations. That's often sufficient. One last comment before I let you go. We'll have to worry about memory management. So we assume that there's some way to allocate memory. And that's pretty much all you need to know about this for now. So we'll ignore how this is done. We'll just assume that this works. For most of it, you can pretend we're programming in C, just that we have these variable size registers or variable size words.